Hi everyone and welcome to the second BN Conversations piece. We're delighted you can join us as we continue to look at key areas of interest in basic income from around the world. Uh, as always, I have Sarath and Louise joining me here today and we're going to be looking in particular at the current work and experiences that are taking place in the US when we're joined by our guests Scott Santons and Professor Carl Widerquist later in the show. Uh, to kick things off though, we're going to have a little chance to reflect on some of the key areas that we've been looking at recently. Uh, Louise, how have you been doing and are the particular areas in the news that have been striking you recently? Yeah, so in the last episode I talked a little bit about uh, the difference uh, between the furlough schemes and um, some of the proposals for emergency UBI and, and so on, two very different approaches to secure people economically. Um, and I think I said I don't think you need, I don't particularly see a competition between the two I don't think there's, there needs to be a polemic there, but what did strike me actually this week was um, how it, the fact that people on furlough schemes aren't allowed to work. And of course, the reason that was put in was because uh, presumably people are self-isolating at home. But actually, it now turns out that the condition, these conditions on the furlough schemes, which, uh, which are that people mustn't work, actually may contribute to an unemployment crisis. So. This is an example for me of the lack of joined up thinking between you know, the problem of the health crisis and the problem uh, of, of the economy and employment and how, you, how these things are linked. Because what we see is that a lot of companies now uh, that cannot survive without people working from home cannot access the furlough schemes. And because they can't access the furlough schemes, the very people who are now working from home, looking after the children working full time, actually are more at risk of unemployment in a month or two. Start. And, and we're seeing that in the big, uh, big companies uh, that most rely on their workers to continue to exist and who couldn't apply for the furlough schemes. So for me, what does that show? Well, it shows that we are actually seeing, even in the context of furlough schemes, which aren't, which aren't emergency UBI or anything like that, but they're in an emergency income sustaining measure, we see the same mentality that we're fighting, I think, when we're uh, arguing for basic income, which is the idea that if you get assistance from the government, then you must be in a passive state. You can't be a contributing person within the economy. And of course, the debate is continuing about, you know, we now must we knock people off this dependence and so on. So it's a completely wrong way of looking at uh, what uh, or the justification for government supporting society and investing in society, which is actually people are productive, people are naturally productive. And, and now the, the same mentality uh, has just led us into completely contradictory scheme. Uh, in which um, pe people are working and then facing unemployment uh, because of a design flaw. Oh, yeah, that's a really interesting point. I think, as you say, particularly that idea of this, this comment about weaning people off um, the support. None of us have asked for it to be there, none of us wants it to be there in the sense of this crisis. And yet, actually, we have seen it have an impact in terms of, so far, uh, the, the unemployment rate. It'd be interesting to contrast that with our, our American guests later. Um, but it shows to me that underlying mentality and approach, as you say, around all of us are to be suspicious around and suspected of why we ever ever need support. Sarath, for you in, in India, are you seeing similar types of reactions or discussions? I, I don't think there's a furlough scheme in place uh, in India. But are some of these kind of mentalities that Louise touched on coming up for the political discussion around COVID uh, where you are? You're on mute. You're Mike, you're muted. Um. Uh, <laughs> in the Indian context, um, uh, more than COVID itself, I think the its impact on the economy and uh, I think there's tremendous amount of confusion. I think there are announcements and announcements and promises and promises. And uh, I think trying to trying to give relief to people at a symbolic level rather than in actual uh, relief itself. So um, there is a kind of a policy paralysis, I see, and uh, some nothing concrete. And then the existing welfare thinking and welfare system is completely um, un unable to address what's going on. So there is the civil society on the one hand and there is the government on the other hand unable to work together. And uh, this, is a, this is a period of a complete confusion. 
So um, I think in, in the next couple of weeks, uh, we will see something more concrete. The biggest issue that we are facing is that we have about 50 million uh, inter-province uh, migrant workers who are all returning because they have no work because of the lockdown. So that's a massive thing happening on the highways. So those are the things we are dealing with. I, um, in terms of concrete policy, I don't think we are anywhere uh, to, to say anything concrete. Uh, and it's a, it's a kind of a traumatic situation here. I think maybe I, in the US, I think we will have our guests uh, uh, speak more and say what's actually the situation there because uh, I think even the impact is quite massive on US. Well, one of the reasons I call this crisis a great revealer is that what you what you see is that governments who've invested less in health, whether it's because you don't have an adequate health insurance scheme in the US or whether you've had sustained austerities in the UK, are having to implement much harsher lockdown and more lock, sustained lockdown measures simply because they haven't got the equipment. They haven't got the beds yeah. and, and literally, yeah. and what you're seeing in the UK now is that people have internalized this message that uh, this message of fear that, that they can't go out and they can't return to work and the government is going to have real problems getting people out of the house because people yeah. don't actually understand yeah. that the reason we're in this situation is, is, it's not because we can't function as a society with, with COVID, but we can't function because we haven't got the health capacity. We haven't got strong enough government. Uh, and that's now come to bite, bite us in the back because we now can't return and have a strong economy. Um, so it, it shows the importance of uh, services, I think, alongside uh, something like uh, universal basic income. But one question um, I really want to put to the panel, and, and I hope you, you want to just the guests would reflect on, is this sense of in which when we talk about emergency UBI and um, recovery UBI, um, are we talking about, are we presenting UBI in a context of crisis? I and mean, clear, clearly we are. And if we do that, are there risks attached to that? Is, is representing UBI in terms of a crisis a risk or an opportunity? Um, for example, could it reinforce the sense that a U, UBI is just a relief measure? And if yeah. people think it's just a relief measure, are they going to believe in it as a permanent institution? Yeah. You know, and yeah. is there is is that um, is there a tension there, or, or do you not think that there is a tension there? I mean, the only thing I saw Scott had put on Facebook yesterday is really interesting um, piece about the the this, the senator that you're working for in Kentucky, I think, who who are who seems to be arguing for UBI in terms of sustaining small producers, and may, maybe that's a switch a switch in the thinking, which could become more permanent. I I don't know. Yeah, it's really interesting. Maybe a good chance to uh, bring our two guests in to uh, contribute to this discussion because I think uh, I just really uh, want to add. I would just want to add, Jamie, uh, to uh, what Louise has said. Now, I would. It would be interesting to ask our guests. You know, why would you want to call this emergency basic income? Why would you call it? Would you have an objection to call it emergency cash relief, emergency cash um, transfer? Uh, is there a good reason to call it a basic income? I mean, uh, that would be interesting to know, both from the point of view of the basic income movement and also the critiques about uh, the terms itself. Yeah, yeah, Jamie. Excellent. Well, I'll ask uh, Scott and Carl to switch on their videos and come uh, join us just now. Um, first, uh, Carl Weidekis, co-founder of US Big and a leading researcher and academic around the issue of basic income for instance well in the 20th century. Um, and Scott Sanson is a very well-known uh, yeah. leading campaigner and activist uh, and advocate for basic income. Uh, he's been living off a basic income of his own crowdfunded uh, since 2016 and now involved, as Louise mentioned, in the senatorial campaign uh, for Mike Brewer in Kentucky, which obviously is involving the rather high profile uh, opponent of Mitch McConnell. So thank you both for joining us today. And I think it'll be really interesting space to explore what's been happening in the US and maybe as Louise said, whether there's opportunity and, and risk ahead. And um, Scott, I wondered if you could perhaps just give us an overview, because I know you've been writing about this a lot on, on uh, social media, about some of the measures that have been brought in so far around the crisis or are being proposed uh, within the Senate and elsewhere uh, for potentially supporting Americans with direct cash payment. Yeah, so uh, first of all, yeah, thanks for, for inviting me to be a part of this discussion. And um, yeah, it's uh, I, let's let's start off with 
the fact that that our, our big thing that we did, um, pretty much first of all, was the CARES Act here in, in the U.S. And, and the CARES Act focused on uh, getting money to people uh, in a targeted way. And it was a one-time stimulus check. And so this was uh, $1,200 uh, per adult and $500 per kid. And it, uh, it left out those earning, if you're a single adult, you got nothing if it was over um, $98,000. And still to this day, um, you know, that was passed back in, in, was it March, I believe? And um, uh, about half of the people still haven't, you know, gotten anything yet. So there's still a lot of checks out there um, that, that haven't arrived yet. And, you know, part of that is, is like the people who got it quickest was the people with direct deposit information on file. And uh, the people who are, are getting the slowest are the, the people who are getting mailed checks. And they put in a couple processes uh, along the way to try to get more people to get their information via direct deposit. And uh, it was, it was interesting to seeing like, you know, what is it in practice of trying to get as much uh, you know money to people as, as possible. And, um, and they also went the route of, of kind of trying to do what other countries are doing as far as trying to keep people employed. And that was via loans. And um, those loans, um, because of the PPP program was also, it, it was on the condition that people keep their, their entire workforce. And uh, it's, it, which is interesting too, because so the con the condition they they thought that was a good idea to say okay if you keep one hundred percent of your workers then you won't have to repay back this loan, and um, as it turns out you know like just a matter of weeks later we started reopening and limiting restaurants and, and you know businesses to twenty five percent capacity, so now you can see there's a there's a big conflict there where if you're a restaurant and you're forced essentially to keep one hundred percent 100% of your workforce and you really don't need 100% of your workforce because you're only allowed 25% capacity, then this can really push a lot of people who are opening, you know, out of business. Um, it, there, it's, it's another one of those interesting examples of problems with conditionality, the unintended consequences. And uh, so that's the, that's the thing that we got through. And, oh, and then a part of the CARES Act, too, was uh, $600 per week in unemployment boosting. So this was, uh, in the U.S., we have essentially 50 different, you know, programs for unemployment insurance. And this added essentially a floor of $600 per week or $2,400 per month um, for those receiving unemployment and, you know, that was, again, it's interesting to, to that amount. They're thinking, all right, well, let's make sure that, that at least all of the unemployed get this much. And, um, but leveraging through the state-by-state -state system, then, of course, we just left out all kinds uh, of people. And even though they tried to include them, too, so they were saying, all right, we don't usually count gig workers and these kinds of things, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll try to reach them. And, of course, states weren't set up for that. And so that was an issue. And then, of course, like we had people who weren't able to sign up, the server problems, you know, people waiting and calling back over and over again, people calling, actually uh, qualifying, and then like, you know, not getting any checks. Like a terrible example is in Florida was when, uh, you know, say 3% of the people who had actually successfully applied for unemployment in, in March actually got a check in, in March. So it's just, just an incredible failure rate. And then uh, it's, it's funny now to see, too, that you see these, this, uh, kind of, these problems arising from this uh, 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 focus on unemployment, like uh, Louise was even mentioning earlier. So you've got, uh, you've got these complaints from Republicans saying, well, you know, we're actually lifting people on unemployment higher than the people who are working. So it's like the people who, are, who lost their jobs were considered non-essential, and the people who are still working are considered essential and they're earning less than the non-essential. And then employers are in the position where, you know, should I keep my worker or not, if they are actually be better off unemployed through the unemployment system. And then like Mitt Romney comes in with a bill recently and he's calling this Patriot pay. And he's saying that, well, it's wrong that the unemployed are getting, you know, all this 
$600 a month extra. So let's boost the employed now too with a, uh, an extra $12 an hour raise. And so of course, you know, as, as a basic income advocate, you're looking at this where we're going, okay, well the unemployed are being lifted by $2,400 and they want to lift the employed by $2,000. Like this is it. Like that is a, just do a $2,000 universal floor and you're done instead of trying to focus on all these things and having all the unintended consequences of that. Um, and then, so besides Mitt Romney's, uh, that conservative kind of uh, idea uh, of boosting the employed, we've also got three different bills now in Congress. And that's uh, the, the one with the most support is called the Emergency Money for People Act. And that's got 39 co-sponsors and uh, that's $2,000 per adult and uh, $500 per kid. And then you've got um, uh, a more universal one called the ABC Act. That's got about uh, 11 co-sponsors, I believe. So it's not as much support. And that would be $2,000 fully universally, uh, adult and kid, um, for the duration of, this, of the, the crisis itself, the pandemic itself. And then for a year, it would be $1,000 per month, fully universal. And um, then just the most recent one, we've got the one in, in the Senate, which is from Bernie Sanders and uh, Kamala Harris and um, uh, Ed Markey and Christian Gillibrand. And that's a full $2,000 um, universally um, as well. And um, uh, with an amount for dependents. So that's where we're looking at uh, like legislatively in the US right now. It's really interesting to see how much that debate has, has opened up. And as you say, from different political angles as well. Carol, I mean, as some of you know, we kind of half joked earlier about your, your long involvement with this area, but going back to what Louise was asking earlier, does this feel like there's a big opportunity here to really take that debate around basic income or in universality forward? Or does it feel like there's a potential risk here in terms of the short term nature or perhaps some of the politicization of some of these, these ideas as they're being discussed? Well, your question ties into Sarah's question, which is, should we call it a UBI? And is that important? And I think if it is a, an emergency temporary UBI, we should call it that. If it's not, we should call it something else. The risk here is that things that really aren't very much like UBI are gonna get called UBI. We had this in Spain where Spain expanded their means tested program they did not call it basic income, but the international press said Spain is introducing uh, and introducing uh, universal basic income, which they hope will cover 10% of the population. Well, if it covers <laughs> only 10% of the population, it's not even close to a UBI. And, the Spain, and you can't blame Spain for that. That's the international press. Now, a basic income is a basic income is a cash income on an individual basis, which is unconditional so it's not required that you work it's not required that you don't work it's not required that you you will that you show that you're willing to work um and it's given out either as a right of citizenship or a right of a residency and if it has those character now characteristics it's a basic income now almost everyone in the movement supports a permanent basic income however a temporary basic income is a form of basic income and needs to, so we can call it an emergency basic income or a temporary basic income but if it meets those characteristics it is a basic income and should be called as such and if there's very good reason to move towards a basic income model for an emergency and especially for this emergency there's really four main reasons one is that it is a cushion for the people who don't work and the people were asking to stay home. Normally, we, we, we'd like you know, everybody to work if, if we have good job offers anyway. Um, but at this time, we're specifically, specifically telling people, look, there's an emergency. We can't employ you anymore. You have to stay home for the health of everybody. All kinds of workers are staying home for this. You gotta give them something. So, you, so universal base income does that. Now, but at the same, but as Scott pointed out, you have this problem, you do that if you don't help the people who are working. There are other people who are saying, you're an essential worker. We need you to keep working. Uh, but a lot of those essential workers get really crap pay every day. Basic income gives them a cushion, uh, gives them a bonus. So it's a cushion for those who can't, we're saying you can't work. 
and it gives it gives a bonus for those who are saying, look, please keep working because we really need you. So those are two very important reasons for an emergency UBI. And then the then the third reason for it is that is it is a, a stimulus for the economy as a whole. Uh, a recession actually works a lot like an epidemic. Um, if Jamie gets sick and then he talks to me, I might get sick. I talk to Sarath, he gets, uh, he gets sick and so on and it spreads around. Well, unemployment can work like that. If Jamie loses his job and he used to buy stuff for me, then I'm going to lose my job. But I used to buy stuff from Sarath and he's going to lose his job. And then, then uh, Scott and Louise aren't going to be able to make money because they were selling stuff to Sarath. And a, economists call that the multiplier effect. And it's how good times and bad times spread. When more people are working, more people are spending, more people have jobs, it builds on itself. But when people stop doing these things, it collapses on itself. That's the role for the government. We call that by this wonderful, attractive name of counter cyclical fiscal, mon fiscal policy. Um, it's not a wonderful word, but that's the idea is you want to counteract the contagion by stimulating the economy when it needs to be stimulated. Because it's money. The money that we're all spending on each other essentially goes into banks and disappears. And it chokes off the economy. Basic income keeps that contagion of an economic downturn from spreading. So those are three reasons. Because it's a cushion for those who can't who can't work. It's a bonus for those we need to keep working. It's an overall stimulus for the economy. And then the fourth reason Scott also alluded to, which is that it's simpler. It works better when it gets rid of all these transaction costs. When you say, okay, we're going to target this program. It sounds good. It sounds good. Target to the most needy. The most needy are the ones who have the most difficult proving they're needy. If you have a program where you say, we're gonna give it to everybody but billionaires, that's easy for me to prove I'm not a billionaire because I make over 100,000 a year and I have an accountant do my taxes. The accountant can get all the paperwork to show I'm not a billionaire. Well, if you're in a homeless shelter, you don't have that kind of paperwork. That's a transaction cost. People fall through the cracks because of that and you get delays because of that. We have had in the United States, people who are unemployed and fully eligible for unemployment insurance standing on the phone all day getting a busy signal as they try to file for unemployment insurance. It does not help anyone in the world to have millions of Americans sitting on the phone, dialing and dialing all day for several days and getting nothing but a business signal. You could have an emergency UBI given to every American citizen or every resident of the United States. That data is available from the Social Security uh, Administration or from, or from the Census Bureau or from the Internal Revenue Service, send everybody a check. And in the US, there's a lot of people focusing around this kind of an idea of $1,000 for every child and 2,000 for every adult for at least four months or as long as the crisis lasts. Really interesting. Uh, um, um, yeah, I, I think in terms of making a case uh, that, bind, that, that connects the short term and the long term uh, in terms of a basic income, so the emergency situation or the recovery UBI, which is the stimulus one, and then a, a longer term scheme is, is the institutional innovation that could come about. Uh, and that speaks to both what Carl and Scott have said, is that actually, as Scott said, it's, it's proven to be almost impossible to reach people with these relief schemes properly um, and Ingen Carl has made the case for all the administrative hassles that are involved in targeting, which we all know about. Um, but my question would be, being again skeptical or trying to be provocative, is would the US population, indeed the UK population facing the same question, be willing to have uh, a citizen's register? Would it be willing to have that level of government uh, control over the information and financial transactions and so on? I mean, maybe that's not an important question, but I mean, what might happen, which is, you know, what happened in the build up to the Bolsa Familia Scholar, or uh, Bolsa Familia scheme in, in, in Brazil is that you had this scheme which was, uh, you know, 
targeted scheme, but it ended up covering 25% of the population. So it's not uh, very narrowly targeted. And what, what happened was that for the first 10 years at least, and I still to some extent think this is the case, permanent registers weren't kept. So, you know, you're giving people money, but there was an anti, there was this liberal idea that you can't keep information about people. And so you don't want a register, a national register uh, that keeps or links up information. Well, is, that, is that an issue already, in the US? We already have a national register. It is called, uh, it is called the social security system. It's been in place since the 1930s. It's what, yeah, 80, but does it cover everyone. 85 years old. Everybody has social security number. Um, we have a yeah. we also have a census bureau that's been counting every American resident since 1790. Uh, there but are what? such American fears, but they're really not mm -hmm. based on reality when we've had this information for mm -hmm. a very long time. It's not necessarily linked with with the IRS, but it's it's also it, you don't have to link it with the IRS to give everybody a a check and. Uh, and, and so, uh, so that much, I don't think it's a problem, but I realized I didn't answer your question about the connection between the temporary and the permanent UBI. Will this help or hurt the permanent UBI? I think a temporary UBI will definitely help the worldwide movement. I think there's a good chance that if not the United States, if not Canada, maybe some country in the world is going to introduce a temporary UBI to deal with this emergency. And this is going to change the way the people in that country think. Um, if we do it here in the United States, people say, wow, you know, this was a lot easier than unemployment. I was on that unemployment thing for a while and I was on the hold for hours and hours and hours. And then, I, then we switched to this emergency UBI that was so much better and so much easier. And then other people were like, yeah, at first, those people on unemployment were getting more than I was because I'm, I'm an essential worker. But then I got the UBI and I got this bonus. They got something. We all got something. You see, it was better in this crisis. It makes everybody realize that it's better permanently. So it gives us an experience. And if it happens in even one country, people around the world can say, look how much better this country did in this crisis. We should look at that program next time there's a crisis or maybe just in general. So what, also, what I, I, I just wanted that, to, oh, sorry, sorry, I just wanted, I just wanted to build off, uh, off too, because I, I think it's another element that Carla already mentioned. So I just want to, to again mention it is just that, that the country who adopts this is also going to see the, the stimulative economic effects. And, you know, that's going to be something that uh, the people in that country are going to really like, and they're going to be like, well, you know, how much of this can we keep if this really stimulates the economy and, you know, creates all these jobs and, and, and does all these great things. Um, increases our, our economic growth and you know all these other things then um, maybe we should keep this in some fashion so I think there's that there's that element of it too that will definitely um, help build support. And to what extent uh, particularly Scott for you because I know you're at the, the kind of front line of, of some of the politics just now uh, both in Kentucky and elsewhere to what extent is it starting to be seen as a mainstream policy so I mean here in Scotland, we've got to a stage now where, you know, the First Minister is saying if we had the power, she would introduce basic income tomorrow. It's becoming a policy that will be discussed uh, as such in the coming months and, and years. I noticed in the US that you, there's a lot of traction, but a lot of the candidates who seem to be talking about it, uh, certainly on social media, seem to be kind of uh, Democrat candidates who are standing against maybe incumbents who are very tied to kind of Andrew Yang and a lot of the kind of new thinking that's coming out. Is it still being seen as kind of a slightly fringe concept or is it feeling like it's really moving into that mainstream discussion? That well, so one of the big accomplishments here in the U.S. is um, the fact that, that, uh, that Nancy Pelosi started, you know, talking about this. And, and, and I would say, too, that I, I believe that this was really in, in, in a direct response to a kind of grassroots push. Um, like this happened uh, um, like four or five Fridays ago. I don't remember exactly when. Feels like forever. <laughs> but uh, um, we decided to to do like a nationwide full push on a Friday. We started this on Friday morning and went all through that day on Friday. And that night, Nancy Pelosi, for the first time, mentioned um, that a guaranteed income could be a possibility. 
And then a couple of days later, she again said the same thing. And both these times were entirely on her own and was not, you know, being asked about this. So, you know, this is, is something that reached her and she started thinking maybe, maybe this is something that, that makes sense. And so, you know, that's a, that's a big deal um, to get Nancy Pelosi, at least even thinking about it as a legitimate possibility. So that was certainly a, 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 evidence of the fact that the Overton window has, has shifted here in the U.S. on this policy. Of course, the unfortunate thing about this is that because it was Nancy Pelosi, um, now the conservatives, you know, there was a lot of heavy response on this, like, oh, Nancy Pelosi wants to, you know, bring socialism to the U.S., Nancy Pelosi in a ridiculous, like, uh, $3 trillion dreams and fantasies and you know, it's just, it, it got really partisan. And it, it, of course, it's unfortunate that, I mean, we're seeing that anyways. Like we're in a situation in the U.S. where where masks have become partisan. And so if you're wearing a mask, then you're like a Democrat. And if you don't wear a mask, you're a Republican. It, it's just, it's it's pretty ridiculous. So there is, um, it, it's, it's, it's something that I've always wanted to avoid here in the U.S. It basically kind of being seen as partisan. And so at the same time that, that it's great that we have, you know, someone as high up, in the establishment as Nancy Pelosi talking about this, then that's the risk is that now we're seeing that the, I think there's more of a partisan pushback. And it, we really need, in, in my opinion, someone um, as a, a sitting member of Congress somewhere in either the House or Senate to step up with their own you know, bill and, and say, you know, this is something that's important or even co-sponsor one of the existing democratic bills to cross the aisle. Uh, because yeah, otherwise we're looking at this as, to finally starting to be seen as like a democratic idea and not any kind of um, something that Republicans Republicans can get behind. Uh, the only conservative that I know of behind the emergency based income is Justin Amash. And uh, he actually um, left the Republican party recently over the fact that it became like the party of Trump. And, um, and he almost ran as the uh, libertarian presidential candidate. And then he was actually shoved out uh, from people panicking over whether that would help Trump or not. So, um, you know, he is someone who is, he is definitely open to this idea and supports it at least temporarily. Of course, the problem there is he's considered to be like a black sheep of the Republican party. And the same thing goes with Mitt Romney, where like he was the only one that showed support really for the, thousand uh, dollar cash stimulus when we first started the discussion you know immediately and that was really a big deal and really helpful but again he's seen as like a black sheep of the republican party because he actually voted to he was the only one who voted to impeach trump so we need someone that is not a black sheep to step up and support this and, and i worry what'll happen if that doesn't happen mm. i mean one risk i see is that as you say it it does become viewed in, in an emergency situation where it's a heightened political uh, debate about universal basic income it comes to be seen as partisan. Certainly in the UK, it's very much regarded now as a Labour policy. I mean, you had was a 27 Labour MPs coming out and saying, we want a univer uh, an emergency basic income, and you had the Chancellor ruling it out, uh, the Conservative uh, um, Chancellor. So um, that, that certainly to a certain extent uh, happened here. Um, so, but yeah, I, th I think, so, but I just wanted to finish just to say yeah. that I think what Carl is saying is really, or in the implication of what Carl is saying is that it, for it to work politically, we actually need to see it implemented. And it's just a question whether that, that is going to happen. Um, because I, I do buy the argument that if people experience something like that, is that is when the wider population will buy into it. But when it's still just a partisan issue that's just debated at the level of ideas, people have a much harder time relating to it. Well, this issue is on the table in all of the OECD countries and a bunch of other countries. I think there's a, there's a decent chance that one of the OECD countries or, uh, will, will adopt a basic income or something close to it. And, mm -hmm. and uh, the, the movement is going to get a big boost for that and the world is going to learn a lot from that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really like the argument, uh, Carl, that um, when people actually experience this, uh, it will actually make a big difference to the whole perception 
of what this is. You know, I think in the pilot discussion, we've always been talking about what if the pilots bring negative evidence? Will it have a backlash on uh, the whole idea itself? You know, that was something we have been debating. Now, I really find this really, uh, I really like your argument, Carl, that um, this is something like, um, it's also a kind of a real, real time pilot or reality yeah. pilot, you know, and uh, if people experience this as opposed to the other uh, forms of welfare, like unemployment allowance, I think uh, the, the, it, it will really have a major impact on not just the recipients, but also but also the politicians. Uh, I really find it a very positive way of looking at, it, at, at, at uh, using the term basic income here. Oh, exactly. An emergency UBI is a much better experiment than any small scale pilot project. A small scale pilot project might have the advantage that you can have a control group, but it has the disadvantage that you're not really testing UBI. UBI is a systemic problem. Uh, sorry, a systemic solution to systemic problems. Problem. And no no small scale pilot can look at how it affects the system. Yeah. But a temporary UBI can look at how UBI affects the system as a whole. And so I think we'll learn much more from, yeah. from a temporary, real temporary UBI than we will from a pilot project. But would you then say that what's happening in Brazil uh, is a temporary UBI? If it causes a third of the population? I have to admit ignorance. I don't know what's going on in Brazil. Well, they've extended the Bolsa Familia scheme, so they've raised the level and I think more people would be included. So you end up with maybe a third of the population being benefited from the cash payment. It's not conditional, uh, um, but is it, can we call it an um, emergency UBI if it's only a third of the population? Um, I would call that like an emergency negative income tax or emergency yeah. negative income yeah. tax. <laughs> but, but it comes back to the question is that there's a yeah. trade-off between yeah. being precise about the terms and having this political uh, catch on. But if, if yeah. you get something like that, that is a step in the direction of UBI, yeah, yeah. but mm. not a UBI, then you yeah. need to talk about in what ways is it like UBI, in what ways it, is it different, and yeah. what good came from it, and did the good come from the fact that it was a step towards UBI, or did the good come from the fact that it was different than UBI? Did the yeah. bad aspects come it from it being like UBI, or from the, the, from the ways it was different? How do they determine who these one third of the population people are and what are the side effects of whatever mechanisms they use to target it. Does that slow it down like I'm worried about? Um, does, it, does it not? Those are the, but there's, a, I think, a great learning opportunity from what's going on here in Brazil. And as long as people are careful in saying, look, this is how it's like it, this is how it's different, these are what its effects are, and here, here's how we can trace their effects, I think that can be a boost for the, for the basic income. It's not, and a learning experience. We don't learn as much about it as we would if, if Brazil was introducing a true basic income, but we've learned a lot from small steps taken in the past. The UBI movement got a big boost. We learned a lot from the initial Bolsa Familia, which is hitting a much smaller amount, and from conditional transfers that have been introduced all around the developing world which have been going on for the last 15 or 20 years that have been much smaller steps in the direction of basic income, but yet they prompted the researchers to write books or things like just give money to the poor and people saying that, look, we find every time you have one of these conditional cash transfer systems, the more generous it is and the fewer the conditions there are, there are the better it works. Well, that means move towards UBI. So I think there's a lot to be learned here. Hmm. I'm afraid, as much as we could keep this conversation going on um, all day, I'm also conscious that we're coming to the end here. But I think that's a very positive note to finish on. I think the language is important, the clarity around the impacts that these policies are having is important, uh, and also the sharing of the knowledge between different countries. I think, as we said in the first uh, episode of this, a critical part of Bien's role and of these conversations is sharing the learning that's taking place in different parts of the world. And I know here in in Scotland and the UK, we've benefited a lot from the conversations with the US, with Canada and with elsewhere to, to learn from them. And I think over the coming weeks, we'll be looking to see where some of those other developments uh, are taking place as well. Uh, so I just want to finish off by thanking both Carol and Scott for joining us today. 
I think it's been hugely informative and you'll be able to see from the BN website links to some of their other areas of work where you can connect in on social media and elsewhere. Uh, thanks to Louise and Sarath as always for joining me for this and we'll be back in a couple of weeks with our next edition so keep an eye on the website uh, for when that's going to go live. In the meantime, keep safe, stay sane and we will talk to you soon. Thank you, Jamie. Thank you, Thank you Jamie. <laughs> Are we Thank off you. air now? Thank you. Yeah, if you can switch off the record.